tell us in the comments. Don't forget to hit the like button and share this video with everyone you know. For this week's episode, I invited an NGO called Fund the Forest, and they're actually pretty new. Um, we were just talking about it a while ago. They're only around nine months old, but they've done quite a few projects, and I'm really excited um, to get to know um, Fund the Forest and also the projects that they do. So let me introduce to you um, the team that I have for today um, for Fund the Forest. We have um, Raf Galvez. He's the director. And then we also have Carrie Nakpil, who is Project Co-Head. And we also have Roque Banzon, who is also Project Co-Head. So there they are. Hi! Hey guys, what's up? What's up, guys? Good afternoon, Hi. everyone. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you also. Yeah, thank you, Erica, for having us here. I'm sure the viewers would want to know, like, a brief background lang. Um, so let's start with Carrie, since you're the only girl. Um, <laughs> tell us where you graduated from and um, what you do now uh, as your career. Hi, guys. My name is Carrie Nakpil. Um, I graduated university from Ateneo. Um, I took up a management degree and... Now, I work in Ayala Malls, Manila Bay. I am in the operations department and I manage the third floor. So if you guys end up here, you know, let me know. <laughs> and um, on top of that, I also handle the sustainability initiatives of the mall. So um, I handle directly the waste management facility and I try to divert as much waste as possible from ending up in the landfill. So what we do is we repurpose the recyclable waste and we also gather our merchants to um, be involved with their junk shop day every Friday. So if oh. I know if there are any merchants, yeah. Like every Friday, there's a junk shop day, so all of the employees are free to like bring in all the recyclables and all of that. Um, that's how we incentivize our merchants to join our initiatives. And um, on top of that, um, the mall's um, earnings from the junk shop day, we use it in a circular economy style and we use it to repurpose our food waste into compost. So we're in the process of making our little cute vegetable nursery and um, it's just it just so happened that um, quarantine hit so we weren't able to pull through with that which is um, another example of if one door if one door closes another window opens so that's how grow happiness um, started because I had a lot of compost um, that was unused from before the quarantine started and I decided how about we engage the, the customers now who are into gardening and who are, you know, starting out with their green thumbs to start composting as well, not just planting, but also, you know, using your food waste at home to to feed your to feed your plants. And I think that's what you picked up on because that is also in partnership with Gcash Forest and Fund the Forest. So, okay. Yeah. In segue to that, I also started with Fund the Forest just recently for a, for our food initiative. Um, it's called the Rainbow Plate. So, um, as Raf will probably mention to you uh, later on, um, Fund the Forest was simply an act to reforest um, uh, our, our our land. So we just it was just planting trees. That was our initial um, goal. And then it branched out into a more holistic um, approach towards sustainability, and one of which is the rainbow plate. So our our advocacy there is you have two bodies, uh, you have two homes, your earth, and, the earth and your body. So how do you take care of both of them at the same time? So on top of that, we also have um, Roque, who's part of the animal conservation arm, who will mm -hmm. explain it later on. Okay, right now, so I'm actually an aspiring vet, vet student, so I'm in the process of getting into UP Las Banas now for being a vet. And yeah, I guess it all rooted from like, you know, being a, well, as a kid watching Discovery Channel, National Geographic, watching people like Steve Irwin and uh, David Attenborough. I was always inspired by them, but I never really did much to get towards that goal for most of my adolescent life. and. It was only until my baseball career ended, which was like last year, 2019, when I really wanted to start working towards my, that goal. So um, yeah, after I stopped playing baseball, I was really looking for a medium to pay it forward 
Um, so like, so I can place my efforts into something that I'm really passionate about, which is animals. Mm -hmm. So being friends with Sila, Isa Barta and Raf, I was always amazed and inspired by the type of content that they put out since like I'd see their stuff on social media. And I wanted to be part of something more meaningful, but you know, coming from a sports science background and then like just a student athlete, I really didn't think I was uh, fitted for the position. Like I'm not an env environmental major. I have no experience in public speaking, <laughs> uh, no experience with nonprofits. So, I mean, I was like the furthest thing from like a suited person for the job, but you know, like my man Kobe Bryant once said, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. So yeah, I, <laughs> I like just decided to message them and I offered to participate around May 2020. And initially I was just supposed to be like a volunteer to help out with some of the projects and eventually they absorbed me. Uh, what a mistake they have made. <laughs> but uh, jokes aside, like I'm really honored to be working with such talented and inspired people that, you know, are, are like-minded. and. Yeah, like Carrie said a while ago, I am a co-project head for the project called Keystone. And in this um, project that we're having, I guess the big picture would be really just providing a voice for the voiceless of our animals here in the Philippines because we're really blessed with like one of the most biodiverse environments in the world. And it's really a shame that they're not getting the attention that they deserve. So and I'm Raf and somehow I'm the director of FTF. Uh I don't know. I think I've I've had a pretty weird journey go getting here. So I graduated MH from Ateneo, um, and after that, I started a record label with some friends, which is like my full time job now. Mm -hmm. So I run a le record label. It's called Liga Artist Group, and what we do is we kind of um, like we organize music festivals regionally and in the Philippines and. Uh, like manage bands generally so do bookings do like the marketing and all of these things mm -hmm. and uh, that came from because generally like my passion is music like i've been a musician my whole life mm -hmm. and so we started that and then like it reached a point where i kind of burned out a bit and things got weird in the philippines so mm -hmm. i needed a shift and somehow my journey took me to myanmar where i lived for a bit more than a year as an educational consultant. My passion really was in community development. Um, like first kind of selfishly, because I just found it super interesting to see, like I'm a history buff and I love to see how things are built. So like kind of selfishly at first, I would look at like communities in the country and say that, for example, an indigenous community this is the only community that you have a chance to really observe from the ground up because development's not there yet. So it started there and I was just really interested. So I'd start doing fundraisers to support projects that would engage and empower them. Like um, the first community or the first organization that I really got to work with was called Project Liwanag. Um, what they would do is they would install off-grid solar electrification systems in communities in Terlap. So it's like communal systems for the whole community, for people who have maybe never had light at night in their lives. Because like how electricity works, or don't quote me on this, but this is my knowledge at least, how it works in the country is you're connected to the grid of Meralco. That's how like we all get it from some sort of central source. But if you're in, an, if you're in a society, if you're in a community that's too far away, then you can't connect to that. So you need like you need other sources of energy, and uh, the source here came in through solar. You know, so this is the only way they had like the only opportunity they had to have light in their homes. So that's something that I thought was super interesting, like from just a historical perspective or from an educational perspective. How would light affect the lives of these people? And I started fundraisers just because I was interested in learning. And through this, like because of these, the Project Liwanag people asked me to come on board. Mm -hmm. Like, so I came on board and I was lucky enough to be able to live with these communities. So I spent maybe I'd say a better part of a year, around eight or nine months, where I'd be living up in the mountains of Terlap for like three or four days a week. Mm -hmm. So um, 
luckily enough, I was able to live with the communities and my passion kind of evolved from just being something that I was really interested in learning from like looking at it from a historical perspective, like how do things, um, how do things develop out of, like how do sci- societies develop, you know? Like how did we come from a point where we didn't know what fire was to a point where we have computers and stuff like that? Like I found that so interesting. And how can we look at that from like a perspective of uh, modern life, you know? Like We literally would not survive without Raf. Raf is like our pillars. Because we're like a very passion-driven um, organization, but you know, can't just be pure passion. Kailangan din ng structure. So honestly, mm-hmm. without rap, we would be a mess. <laughs> so no, that's not that's not completely true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he balances I out lot, the emotional uh, quotient I, by adding the IQ. <laughs> a lot of it. I bring IQ. a lot. Of, that's because I'm like I'm 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 partially dead inside, but I bring in the. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Raf tries to downplay it, but like I've worked with him in college, and I've seen how he manages the team. Um, he puts a lot of structure into our into our feelings and our passions, which is what gets us to move in a more effective way. And yeah, that's why he's director. <laughs> I mean, how so. did this all start, Mr. Director? <laughs> <laughs> so. Like I said, it started with some of her friends, uh, Isa, Maita, and Clara. So you can you can like if you look at the Fund of Forest page, I'm sure they're all over that. So they went on a tour with a group called Mad Travel. So you can look them up also. Uh, th- what they do is they organize local tours in the country, but they take it a step further by involving communities. So it's like. Um, Imagine going to a place and instead of just seeing the sites, you kind of get a taste of how the people who actually do reside there live. So that's the experience they try to give and they try to do it by creating jobs and creating sustainability for these uh, for these tribes or for these people. That tire, so um, they almost didn't reach the community for the tour, but when they did get there, like they were able to um, talk to the people there. They were able to talk to the community and learn about how it is to live day to day and what is the situation in Zambales. You know, because in Zambales, what happened there is um, you have, I'd say, like, I'd say, I think around 2010. I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but the last census that I saw was, I think, 2010. There's around 50,000 Aita people. Mm-hmm. So I don't really know the exact numbers. Uh, but I'd say around 7,000 of them live in Zambales, you know? And that's, that's, it seems like it's a very small part of a population that I don't know how many are we now, like 100 million? It seems like a tiny part. And that's why people don't really give it notice. But with tours like what Mad did, when you experience their lives and when you can meet these people, it just gives a face to 7,000 people, you know? It's like, Something that we experience right now is that we see so many groups of people that it's hard to give them like a persona in our heads because as people, we really identify with personas. Like we watch movies, we, we watch TV shows to identify with the people in them or with the characters, not necessary people there. And it's something that's important also in the real world. Like we talk about groups as groups, but when you're able to actually meet that group and put a face to them, it makes a crazy difference because you're able to put a specific story behind what's happening. That's exactly what happened with Isa. Like, she's, well, Isa, Maita, and Clara. Like, they started from the outside looking in, like, there are indigenous people, okay. They exist. Then they met these people and they were like, wow, um, we've talked to them it doesn't feel like we're any different we just have we just come from different contexts but when we communicate with each other it's like we're born of the same cloth you know it's like what are your dreams like their dreams are i want to plant trees to feed my family i want to make sure that my family has food moving forward that we have the basic human necessities and us like living in the city like me personally 
that's something that I dream of. Maybe not as much as they do because like I come from a very like lucky and privileged background wherein I I recognize that I don't have to worry about it. But of course, I think for everyone in the world, that's part of your dream. Like the dream to be sustainable and the dream to have food on your table, the dream to have water, light will never disappear. It will just be on different levels because of where you're coming from. And so like seeing that, seeing the difference in that level and seeing how the dream is still the same made them want to make a difference. So it, it made them create a project which was essentially let's raise 1 million pesos and reforest the area. So mm-hmm. this is an area that was ravaged by the eruption of Pinatubo. And after the eruption of Pinatubo, it was ravaged by illegal loggers who came in the area who actually did more damage than Pinatubo because sadly enough, like humans actually have way more of an impact than the world does right now. Like we can harm the world more than the, har- the world can harm itself. And like Pinatubo is an example of that or the greater Tarlac Zambales area. It's somewhere where nature came in. It could have recovered from nature, but we didn't act on it. And instead, we destroyed it. And now what you see there is it's all a har. People ended up suffering because they had to resort to or create coal. Like burning their own trees to create coal to sell because they couldn't afford to plant crops to uh, create a sustainable livelihood for farming. So it's like they had to resort to using the resources in a way that wasn't sustainable. And that's what Isa wanted, uh, Isa Might and Clara wanted to combat. Okay. You know, so one million pesos to plant a forest and to help these people or to help our indigenous brothers and sisters have a sustainable lifestyle. And that's how it, that's how Project Lewa, uh, that's how, oh, Project Lewa, that's how FDF started. <laughs> You know, that's how FTF started. And it started from the story of the Aita people of Zambales. I wasn't there, but Sela Isa made Cuento. That's a photo of the kids when they were flying a drone. So oh. it's, like, it's, it's, it's so cute, like how, yeah. how interested they are. And it's like, just wow, look, there's a huge fan up there. That's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they've never seen a drone, so that's why they're all so excited. You can see on their faces. That's really cute. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Next. That, that's the best thing, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's that's a <laughs> calabao. <I> mean, <laughs> enough said. Beautiful creature. Enough said. Okay. okay. That's, that's a keystone. Um, that's I'm an, an, I'm, I'm an animal uh, dude, so I just yeah. wanted to like throw in some animals there. Water buffalo. What represent? sound does a what sound does a carabao make? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. That was probably a horrible, horrible <laughs> sound. But you know heard that first, everyone. V eighty one radio. Take yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it with a grain of salt. I am not even like one hundred percent sure if that's how that sounds. But <laughs> but it's cute. Look at him. He's just eating grass and having a good time. So that's why. It, Shout outs yeah. to the Calabas. More than being <laughs> cute, man, this guy is the MVP. Like, if you see are, how much yeah. work he can do on a farm, mm. or he or she, like, I actually don't know the gender. Like, I don't know how to tell genders of Carabaos without, looking, yeah. without looking at the, you know, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. He or she can do crazy work on a farm. Mm. Like, probably makes everything faster. Like, just co- like connecting... Uh, like a hoe to the back or something mm-hmm. makes everything so much faster and it's amazing how uh, humans and animals can work together to just uh, yeah. to just live you know yeah. okay Ooh, yeah this is nice so yeah, this is in nice. Zambale, am i right yeah. yes yeah oh yeah I so read we show this picture to say that you guys think it's beautiful but <laughs> look at the mountain what color is that mountain mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. It's like you can see it. Like you can see it straight away. There's a green mountain with trees on it. And yes. there's one that's just completely barren. Right. And you can also see like you can also see the lahar. So the lahar is something that um imagine imagine going home, but every single time it rains, 
the road to your home changes yeah. and you have to find a different route. Like mm-hmm. that's yeah. what our that's what our IPs are going through. That's yeah. what some indigenous people have to fight through. Because mm-hmm. this is like this is sand, man. It's like um it rains, everything moves. You know? Yeah. It's not like you have paved roads there and of course we also don't want to bring it in there. But it's a reality that um you live in a place that's made of volcanic ash. Yeah. You all yeah. always have to find a different route, which is crazy because like me, for example, maybe not the best example, but when I go to a gig and maybe I'm not in the best state of mind, I love knowing my way home. You know, mm-hmm. I love having the muscle memory to be able to like walk home or whatever and know that I'll still get home safe. Mm-hmm. And it's such a simple thing. It might be something that I'm lucky enough to experience, but it's something that, you know, wow, I didn't even realize that this was something that was special until you go to a community and you really you realize that uh, some of the trips that we've had going up to the mountain, we had to forge a whole new way. You know, that's crazy. Like to get home, you have to forge your own road. Like, this is the land of this is the land of where indigenous people live. And it's something that's so beautiful that we'd feel so lucky to live in without understanding what it really means to live there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's and, that's yeah. really. And it's because of you guys. Um, people now are gonna understand it more. I mean, me when I first saw the photo, there I was like, oh wow, it looks so nice. But when you explained all of that, I was like, okay. So that's what it means, Alaga. And thank you for showing this photo. I'm very sure the viewers now are just like, okay, wow. So that's what no, sorry. I just wanted to give context, um, just for the rainbow plate, since that is an a currently ongoing um, uh, fundraiser for urban poor communities and in, in partnership with Planet Cora. So um, actually, the proceeds, even for the Grow Happiness initiative that we did in Ayala Malls, Manila Bay, um, proceeds of which will also be going to um, Food Not Fear. So that's our fundraising initiative. And since we started around, um, I think it was June, early June or late May, we were able to feed already and distribute over 200 um, um packs to feed families so we distributed enough funds to feed 200 families and um we were very we're very grateful for all of the generous hearts that have um donated towards this cause um however um this isn't this isn't the bulk of the donations that we have um collected over time so over the even in the beginning um we already turned over funds to um the yangil tribe so the the, the community that we dis- that we um, introduced you guys to earlier um if i'm not mistaken we donated over 200,000 to them and okay. this was able to feed them and sustain their livelihood and um that was the first leg of fund the forest so that was the first turnover that happened two months after the first the launch of fund the forest so the launch was the gig of raf the the bait of isa that said uh, okay. oh i don't want to be part of it but oh wait there's a gig so i'm in i'm in that's that's the that's the, that's the start of fund the forest and since then um, two months after that, that was the first turnover. So um, things have been moving quite fast since then. Um, what projects do you guys have under Fund the Forest? Carrie, ladies first. Okay, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. I thought you'd never ask, bro. <laughs> okay, That's you, okay. Bro. Thank you, thank you. Um, so um, Rainbow Plate actually started with a super For simple Mara. idea. Just like every, just like this whole initiative to begin with, it always started small. So, um, with Fund the Forest, it was really just to um, plant trees. But for the Rainbow Plate, we really just wanted to inform people that um, what you eat has a significant part of um, impact to the environment. So that's how we came up with our advocacy: is you have two homes, the earth and your bo- and, and your body. How do you take care of both of it? And since then, it used it started out simply with just informing people and using our Fund the Forest Instagram as an educational platform to um, see the effects of Meatless Mondays, for example. Um, if one person does Meatless Mondays, this is how much thousands of kilograms of greenhouse gases emitted if you do it for a year. 
and the numbers were significant and we pursued it even further by um, saying uh, how can how can a plant-based diet work for you in terms of the health benefits that you'd receive mm -hmm. and then how it related to food security the transition from um, um, nutrition awareness and um, the effects of the of, of the food you eat to the environment it transferred and kind of switched and added another dimension on food security which is very relevant to the Philippines especially now during the pandemic where feeding is feeding people is a is a big problem um, even prior to the pandemic um, it was hard to reach the farmers to the end users or the broader end users and that's how um, we ended up in partnership with Planet Cora to raise funds for Food Not Fear and to feed urban poor families as, a, as an extension to the initiatives of Rainbow Plate. And um, since then, we were able to um, feed over 200 families. And um, if you guys are still willing to donate, we're still accepting donations. And um, that's, that's how it started from just being a simple meatless Mondays to becoming a, a, an initiative to feed our um, local and if community. you want to live a sustainable lifestyle um, you don't have to do it right away because like interconnectivity and all of these things are a journey you know it's not something you realize like one day you wake up and you're just like today I'm the most sustainable person in the world <laughs> you know? Yeah, it, it'll up. never feel like that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that yeah. I can do better. So I think that's like as FTF, that's something that we're really trying to show. Like we're trying to show people our journey. That um, all of our members, there's eleven of us. Like, who's the oldest? In, uh, I don't know. Who's the oldest on the team? Is that me? Maybe, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I'm actually not sure. It, it might be me. I'm 25, so the oldest on the team is like 25. Like we're no. young, we're yeah. very young, we're, we're very young. Really. That, that means we make so many mistakes, man. Like we're young. I don't know who I am. People here don't know who they are, but we know who we we know what kind of impact we want to make on the world, and I think that's more important. It's like. <laughs> you find yourself through the difference or through the change you make you know it's not like it's not like trying to trying to like um this is me and because i'm a sustainable person i should create sustainability in the world it's yeah. like i love the idea of sustainability and i'll try to my best to fit into that lifestyle yeah. um i might not be there yet but i can be in the future and like yeah. that's why I love this team so much because I have people like Carrie. Like Carrie's so like she's very very like passionate about food insecurity and very very passionate about like single use plastics and all of these things. And she teaches the team. Rock is so passionate about animals in Keystone and how everything connects. And he teaches us. And uh, I think like aside from that, we also have a program in our team we're in we invite external people to give us lessons once a week about education about photography about technology anything and it's just so cool to be able to learn from a lot of people mm -hmm. i guess my like my educational background is kind of showing but you know that's i think that's the thing i really love about uh ftf as an organization that's why like i'm so happy to have rocky and carrie here because they're huge parts of it and they really do like teach the team a lot about what we can do together. Um, I guess, okay, for starting off with Keystone, I just want to define first what Keystone is. So like, in your head, you might be thinking, ano ba tong susing bato na to, diba? Like, I mean, <laughs> it doesn't really make much sense, right? If you think about it. But, okay, so let me go first for the original definition of Keystone. So, you know stone arc? Arch arches like right, you know like stone arcs that like that that you walk walk through the bad like, mm. that's like piled up like that the bad kind of makes like an arc. Sorry yeah. for all of those who are listening and can't see my hand gesture. But that's yun, <laughs> yung, yung, yung arc na yun. The keystone is the piece in the middle. So this is like the most important piece in the arc because if you take it out, the entire arc collapses. So it's the piece that holds the weight, that holds and like manages the weight so that it keeps the structure. Okay. So now in, in ecology, naman, 
a keystone species is one that plays an important role in affecting the abundance and all the other surrounding animal species. And our project name takes inspiration from this concept because um, ultimately what we want to do is we strive to honor the interconnectedness of life, like what Raf said earlier, mm-hmm. and to inspire Filipinos to take action towards playing a positive role in conserving the Philippine species that we live alongside. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, these keystone species are like, I don't know if any of you guys have watched the video of like gray wolves in Yellowstone National Park. So basically in the U.S., they started killing off gray wolves because it was eating their livestock, you know, big bad wolf mentality. It's like they don't want them around anymore. And then after a while, the, like the entire Yellowstone National Park, which is ginormous, um, started like deteriorating. So less and less animals, less and less um, like other species to survive. And then a couple of years back, they reintroduced the gray wolves there. And then right after that, the entire park started flourishing. More species were coming around, like more um, plants even. It's just like, it's it really made, the wolves really made an impact. And that's what we're trying to um, personify, like how our organization will make an impact such that the existing species around us thrive rather than deteriorate. For the future plants, it's more of, uh, working with more collaborations with more sanctuaries and um, um, con- conserv- uh, conservatories. And then we also hope to collaborate with more local brands so that you know, we can like, help each other out, uh, raise awareness for both their brand and ours as well. And uh, one of our bigger goals is to like have a coloring book and educational programs. So whether it's like so we plan to kind of have like a coloring book wherein the animals there so it's for children obviously and then on the side we could like share a little story about the animal and kind of you know start them start them getting exposed to the animal our native animals like earlier on and yeah just watch out for fundraising events and we'll be posting a lot of fun content in the nearby future um okay wait first i just want to give a like kind of like what the value of like what Fund the Forest really tries to emit. And it's really just that um, you don't have to be anyone but yourself to make a difference. And that's what we're really trying to send forward as our message. And like for me, my, my, my final words and tips would be don't wait around for like an opportunity to fall into your lap if you really want to work towards your passion. Um, like if you don't know your passion, that's completely fine as well. Do and try different things so that you can find what truly matters to you personally. And if you do know what your passion is, don't sit around and wait for an opportunity to come by. Make the effort to go out and expose yourself to situations and people that would bring you closer towards your goals. Like for me, I really didn't think that I was suited to be part of like this organization. I didn't have the credentials at all, but you know, I shot my shot. And next thing you know, I'm making animal noises in Mad TV. So I guess <laughs> what I want to say is like life is too short for you to wait around for your calling. And there's so many uncertainties in life. So you should go focus on the things that you should, that you can control and reach out to like-minded people and situations that you can throw yourself out there. And of course, lastly, you don't have to be anyone to make a significant difference in this world. You just have to be you. We really want people to like if you really want people to connect with what you're doing you have to love it and uh, our country and our countrymen indigenous people everyone around us there's so much to love about that like i know like our country now is weird you know i'm gonna go into that but our country is weird now and it's very negative but if you look at if you look at it don't look at it from a societal scale look at the individuals that are around you uh look at the individuals who are living in the mountains look at the individuals who are living in the like in the oceans all of these places there is so much to love there's so much to care about and focus on that thank you raf <laughs> thank you kari and thank you roque i super enjoyed today's talk and i hope you guys enjoyed as well um for the viewers please follow fund the forest they're on instagram and these guys are also on instagram so if you want to get involved with fund the forest hit them up 
it, they're a very very good organization and they're gonna go places so good luck guys I hope to see you guys soon um, yeah you know, this um, that, would, that would be fun so thank you yeah. guys there and I'll talk to you guys soon stay tuned for the next episode only here on Z81 Radio Manila